Good evening. What a wonderful occasion. The celebration of diversity, the celebration of our country, our state, and the celebration of a remarkable individual, the Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Bringing our welcome for this afternoon is Ms. Karen Gresham, Deputy Commissioner, West Virginia Culture and History. Thank you, Patricia. Welcome on behalf of Commissioner Randall Reed Smith and all of the staff here at the West Virginia Division of Culture and History. The Culture Center, we believe, is the premier welcome center for the state of West Virginia. Located right here on the state capitol complex, it offers visitors from around the world a glimpse of our people, our culture, and our heritage. We strive to present the many faces of our state in our museums, in archives, and in all of our exhibits. You will see that today. We are delighted, as we have been for the last few years, to showcase the fabulous art of these students during the MLK Junior Program for Diversity. Every year, I am amazed at how these students do such a wonderful job of taking a very serious theme and bringing it to youthful life with their art. The standing exhibit to my left was designed by our staff. It recognizes some of our state's noteworthy and exceptional African-American residents. If you take a few minutes to look at this exhibit, you will be proud to see how many wonderful African-Americans are true mountaineers. If you walk to the north of the gallery in this building, you will see photographs from Charleston's Norman family. This collection of photos, letters, architectural drawings, and more represents a family that we believe is most definitely one of the influential West Virginia families of our times. John C. Norman was one of West Virginia's first black architects. If you are a West Side resident or if you attend West Virginia State University, on the walls of this gallery and in his collection here, you will see photographs and drawings, renderings that will make you say, I know where that building is. His wife, Ruth Norman, was an educator who taught for 42 years at Garnet and Stonewall Jackson High Schools. She had her own radio show, and in 1987, Governor Moore presented her with the Washington Carver Award. Their son, Dr. John C. Norman, Jr., was a renowned cardiologist who is hailed internationally for his dedication and his unparalleled work in research of cardiology. In the state capitol rotunda, you will see the colorful exhibit of the artwork of Huntington native Elaine Blue. I encourage you to see it. It's captivating. West Virginia is a state of many ethnic diversity, much ethnic diversity. We have in our state people from many cultures, and we are very proud to host this event, which celebrates one of our most important cultures here in the state. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Karen. At this time, we will have the invocation rendered by the Reverend Dr. Jerry L. R. Staples, pastor of the Liberty Baptist Church in Charleston, West Virginia. And Reverend Staples has done many things, and one of the things that I'm, I'm sure that he's proudest of is the way that he was able to build his Sunday school to make it one of the largest in the state of West Virginia. The Reverend Staples, uh, information about his biographical sketch is contained in your program, so please take time to read about him and the other persons who will be presenting on today's program. Reverend Staples, our invocation, please. May we bow our heads. Father, we thank you for another grand occasion, a celebration of diversity. Lord God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you, God, for giving us all traveling grace down the dangerous highways and byways. Thank you, God, for the brain trust for putting this together. Uh, Lord, we just uh, thank you for 
the food that has been prepared. Thank you, O oh God, for our speaker this evening. God, we just pray that uh, you would just continue to bless uh, this occasion. We love you and we give you praise, for we know that all good and perfect gifts come down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no valuableness, no shadow of turning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. We are in for a musical delight this evening. We would like to welcome for their performance, Ms. Murray Jackson, uh, who was born and raised in Lexington, Kentucky, and she's currently an instructor of music at Bluefield State College in Bluefield, West Virginia. She sings jazz, R&B, gospel, and classical music, and her versatility has afforded her many prestigious performance opportunities. During the spring of 2007, she was a featured artist at the This Is Her Story, This Is Her Song National Symposium at the University of Maryland, which focused on African-American women and their contributions to music. Bob Thompson is a well-known artist in the Charleston, West Virginia area. And since 1991, he has been pianist and a regularly featured artist on West Virginia Public Broadcasting's NPR syndicated radio show, Mountain Stage. For the tw past 23 years, he has also been co-producer and host of Joy to the World, a holiday jazz show broadcast on public radio stations nationwide and heard internationally. <clears throat> Bob was recently inducted into the West Virginia Music Hall of Fame and the latest recording by the Bob Thompson Band, Look Beyond the Rain, was just released January 8th on Blue Canoe Records. We welcome for their performance, Mary Jackson and Bob Thompson. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Stewart and the Office of Diversity, Governor Tomlin, and everyone who was involved with um, inviting me here. I'm really grateful to be here. Um, I'm also really grateful to be sharing the stage with one of West Virginia's brightest stars, Mr. Bob Thompson. So I'm really grateful. Um, I'm going to be singing a couple of Duke Ellington tunes, and um, the reason I chose Duke Ellington is because he actually visited West Virginia quite often years ago, specifically southern West Virginia. Um, he was initiated uh, through uh, a, a bunch of gentlemen at Bluefield State College into Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And when he was initiated, they had a concert in celebration of that initiation, and they also uh, the concert also uh, raised money for scholarships for students at Bluefield State. Um, so one of those songs that was performed, or one of those, uh, one of his compositions, was um, a little piece called "Satin Doll." Cigarette holder that wicks me over my shoulder. He digs me out, cutting that satin doll. Baby, can we go out skipping? Careful of me, go. I know you're flipping. Speaks Latin. And all. He's nobody's fool, so I'm playing it cool as can be. I'll give it a whirl, but I ain't for no guy chasing me. Switch your telephone number. Well, you know, I'm doing my rumba with the no.
He's nobody's fool, so I'm playing it cool as can be. I'll give it a try, but I ain't for no guys tasting me. Switch your knee, telephone number. Well, you know, I'm doing my rumba with you no know, that my sand I'll can that sand Mr. Bob Thompson. Um, this next tune that we're going to sing for you is one of Duke Ellington's um, sacred pieces during the latter part of his life uh, when he was visiting West Virginia. He was very um, adamant and really into composing and performing his sacred pieces. And I was introduced to his sacred pieces by a composer and musicologist and theorist that I look up to by the name of Dr. Kathy Bullock. And she introduced me to his sacred pieces and I've been in love with them ever since. Um, so this piece that um, I'm going to sing for you is called Come Sunday. To others as you would have them do unto you. And to have a bride by and by. Oh Lord, dear Lord above, God 
God Almighty, God of love, please look down and see my people through. Special thank you to Mr. Thompson and Ms. Jackson, and you will hear from them later in our program. At this time, it is my pleasure to present to you our governor, the Honorable Earl Ray Tomlin, governor of the state of West Virginia. And upon behalf of the Martin Luther King Jr. State Holiday Commission, Governor Tomlin, we would like to express our appreciation for your support of our commission. You, know, it, it, you have to have the governor's support to keep doing a good job, and we do appreciate that. It's our pleasure to work for the citizens of West Virginia to keep these very important events before you. And what Governor Tomlin did with the establishment of the Herbert Henderson Office of Minority Affairs, he did something else that had never been done before, too. He appointed the Dr. Carolyn Stewart as the chairperson of the commission. And so now we have a viable place, you know, within the confines of state government to keep our commission moving forward to provide these kinds of activities for children and citizens in the state of West Virginia. So on behalf of the commission, Governor, thank you so much. At this time, the governor is coming forward for his remarks, and that will be followed by the awards presentation. Let us welcome our governor, <laughs> Governor Earl Ray Tomlin. Thanks. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, uh, Patricia, for that very kind introdu <clears throat> introduction. And I'm pleased to join all of you today to celebrate West Virginia's rich history and diverse culture. I'd like to take a moment also to recognize my team at the Herbert Henderson Office of Minority Affairs and members of the Martin Luther King Jr. State Holiday Commission and the staff here at the Culture Center in Charleston. And thank you all for hosting this annual celebration to celebrate diversity in West Virginia. One of the things I love most about our state is its rich history. West Virginians are proud to share stories about their roots with friends, neighbors, and visitors to our state. And like so many hardworking West Virginians, the Mountain State has had to overcome its fair share of adversity and, and struggles of our own. But through the years, we have persevered and become a stronger, more resilient people. As we gather together to celebrate Black History Month in West Virginia, we reflect on the lives of those from generations past, like educator Booker T. Washington, civil rights leader Leon Sullivan, and civil rights attorney Herbert Henderson. These brave men and their courageous acts have helped inspire West Virginians of today, who continues to stand up for their beliefs and create positive change in their communities. During my State of the State address, I was proud to highlight the story of Katherine Johnson, a West Virginia native who defied the odds of her time and achieved her dreams and became a NASA scientist. For 33 years, Catherine worked for NASA and published 26 scientific papers, including the first paper ever published by NASA's Flight Research Division with a woman's name on it. Catherine's research was used to complete the Mercury and Apollo missions and was critical to sending man into space and bringing him home safely. For decades, 
Catherine's story was hidden in the pages of our state's history books until this past November, when she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom for her incredible contributions. While West Virginians, like Catherine, have achieved national and international recognition, our state is also home to some of the best and brightest who have overcome personal challenges. That in, that in turn have led to leading a life of public service, like our own Dr. Carolyn Stewart. She's the, as was mentioned, she's the executive director of the Herbert Henderson Office of Minority Affairs. Since I first established the Minority Office in 2012, I've had the privilege of working alongside Dr. Stewart and getting to know her both on a personal and a professional level. And her story is truly inspiring. After completing the ninth grade, Dr. Stewart dropped down of high school and entered the workforce. Several years later, after realizing the importance of a good education, she went back to school and got her GED. She enrolled in a two-year program and used those skills to find a better future for herself and her family. Through personal responsibility, perseverance, and hard work, she was able to go from a GED to a PhD to the governor's office. <laughs> Dr. Stewart is a dear friend of mine and has done an incredible job at the Herbert Henderson Office of Minority Affairs. And I'm thankful for her commitment to ensure all West Virginians can achieve success. Like so many others, these West Virginians have worked hard to overcome adversity, pursue their dreams, and open the door of opportunity for future generations. The work we've done and the progress we continue to make is helping us build momentum to give our state's future generation the opportunity to achieve long-term success. Across West Virginia, we're working to provide all students with innovative learning environments and equal opportunities to get the education they deserve. Our students at Mary C. Snow Elementary on Charleston's west side are among many West Virginia students who find themselves in culturally diverse learning environments. And they are not just achieving excellence in education, they're excelling. We must continue to do everything we can to encourage our students and let them know that we care about them and about their future. I remain committed to ensuring every West Virginia student has the training and skills they need to get a good paying job to lead a happy life, healthy and fulfilling life, right here at home. So I want to thank all of you for being stewards of change, and I'm confident that together we, continue, we can continue to make positive differences in West Virginia. At this time, I'd like to ask Patricia to join me as we present the award winners for this year's poster contest. Patricia. This is always a very special part of the program, and what we would like to ask you to do, when your name is called, if you would please come forward to receive your certificate, and then we have a special gift that we will give you from the commission, and I'm going to ask Julie Pallas to come forward and assist with that. And then the members of uh, Beta Beta Omega chapter, if you will assist with handing the governor these certificates when the student's name is called. And we do have some teachers that are present, and if you would like to come forward with your student, please feel free to come forward for the picture opportunity. In the elementary division, our third place winner is Jasmine Klein, fifth grade student at Gilbert Middle School. Teacher is Caitlin Davis. Our second place winner, third grade student at Shoals Elementary School, 
Charleston, West Virginia, Ms. Savannah Grant, her teacher, Mary Casey. <laughs> and the first grade, first place winner in the elementary division, Nathan J. Martin, second grade student, Birch Elementary School, Del Barton, West Virginia. Teacher Teresa Hanshaw. In the middle school division, our third place winner, Frankie Nikki Hatfield, eighth grade student at Gilbert Middle School, teacher Caitlin Davis. Okay. She did not make it today. Our, our second place winner in middle school, Johanna Smith, Buchanan Upshur Middle School in Buchanan. Her teacher is Sherry Butler. And those students that are not present, we will have their awards sent to them. Our first place winner is here, Josie Blankenship, seventh grade student at Gilbert Middle School, teacher Caitlin Davis. In the high school division, we do have three areas. We have the, you know, what we call the regular artworks, we have mixed media, and we have photography. It is my pleasure to present the third place winner, Dustin Chambers, 12th grade student, Mingo Central High School, teacher Doug Martin. Thank you. Our second place winner, Jessica Sturgill, Mingo Central High School, Mingo County, grade 12, teacher Doug Martin. And our first place winner, Megan Taylor, grade 12, Mingo Central High School, Del Barton, teacher Doug Martin. Thank you. In the mixed media, just stay up here, Mr. Martin. In the mixed, <laughs> Mr. Martin and I have a, a long-term relationship. His students enter every year. And so we're just so proud of the work that he does. 12 years continuously having his students to enter. 
And you do have to take time to look at all of the students' artwork. It is just tremendous. It came to my, the, the, the artwork came to my office and I had different faculty members coming by. When can we purchase that piece? So, so we're so proud of the work that these students have done. Our third place winner in mixed media, Kirsten Runyon, grade 12, Mingro Central High School. Our second place winner, Casey Smith, grade 12, Mingo Central High School. She, and I, she may not have made it here, but we're, we're gonna just call her name, Casey. All right, we'll have, we can give Mr. Martin her award. Give it to Doug. And our first place winner in the mixed media, Charlsey L. White, first place, Mingo Central High School, Del Barton. Thank you, and you can get the bag from Julie for In the uh, final category for high school, that category is photography. And the third place winner is Patience Brumfield, Lincoln County High School, Hamlin, West Virginia, teacher Paul Elliott. Is she here? We'll come. We're going to have Mr. Elliott to come forward. He is another teacher who has supported the commission through the years. We thank him for all of his efforts. We could just give him that one. And then our second, that we can get one with the teacher. Thank you. And then our second place winner, Carden Tudor, grade 10. I know she's here. Uh, Lincoln County High School teacher, Paul Elliott. And our first place winner in photography, she's not here. She is not here, but I'll just call her name, Danielle Hanna, first place, Lincoln County High School Paul Elliott teacher and he can take her award. You can get the bag too, Mr. Elliott. That concludes our award presentation and let's give all of our winners another round of applause. We are really in for another treat today. Uh, we do appreciate the governor assisting with the award presentation and taking time for the photo opportunities for the, the students. Uh, the next th thing that it is my pleasure to do is to introduce our speaker of the hour. And I have known this young lady for several years and she and I have been together now in the last two weeks a lot of times. We, uh, she received the Governor's Living the Dream Award at our ecumenical service on last Monday. So we want to give her a round of applause right now for receiving that award. Michelle, to me, she's Dr. Michelle Foster, but Michelle to us in the community because of all of the things that she has done for citizens in the state of West Virginia. She is currently the CEO of KISRA, the Kanawha Institute for Social Research and Action. And she has served in that capacity since 1998. I can remember when her mentor, Reverend Haliger, first told me about this dynamic young woman and the work that she had done. She left a very lucrative career in the chemical industry to become a community servant. 
She is intensely driven with her skills. She is analytical. She has outstanding leadership. She is a master at nonprofit management, and she has excellent skills in technology. With the Kizra team working with her, she has empowered thousands of West Virginians to higher levels. I personally know about some of her parenthood programs and her programs for male mentoring and programs to benefit fathers, to teach them how to be fathers to their children, teaching entrepreneurship, how to build your credit so that you can have a home. And those are just some of the few things that she has done in the community. Her work has not gone un unnoticed because she has been recognized locally and nationally. In 2012, she was honored to be recognized as a fatherhood champion of change by President Obama at the White House. Michelle will transition from Kisra to the Greater Kanoi Valley Foundation on February 8, 2016, where she will serve as president and CEO. And while that is Kisra's loss, it is the state of West Virginia's gain because her expertise will now be more widespread throughout the state. Please welcome to the podium as our guest speaker, Dr. Michelle Foster. Good evening, everyone. I recognize our chief executive of the state of West Virginia, our governor, Governor Tomlin, uh, to the commission represented by Dr. Stewart and Ms. Wilson. Thank you for this invitation. It's my honor to stand here before you today. And let's give it up for our young people who just got those awards. And also for those teachers, I know to pull anything off where you, get, you, you gotta get students to work, it takes a lot of encouragement and motivation. And just to see that those, those teachers are so dedicated that they've been doing this for so many years. We appreciate you too, as well. As I meditated on what to speak about today, the, the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King resonated in my spirit. And I reflected on what his most famous speech means to me and its relevance in today's world. About a year or so ago, I had done an, another um, speech and at the time I asked my Facebook friends, what does this, you know, the, the dream speech mean to you? At the time I was good, gonna be giving a, a, a speech to the, I was gonna be going to prison, to, to a correctional facility, to give a, a speech to staff who were working there. So it was a kind of a, you know, unusual audience, let's just say that. Several liked the fact that I was gonna be do, doing that. And only two of, of my Facebook friends at the time, who happened to be white, were bold enough to share their feelings. One stated that she was nine years old and, and watched Dr. King give the speech on her parents' black and white television. She believed that the speech planted the seeds of social justice in her heart. Another wrote that to him the speech means that no matter what family we were born into, what neighborhood we grew up in, what mistakes we have made in our lives, what age we are, or regardless of the current circumstances we find ourselves, that we can still have a dream for a better and more fulfilling and productive life. If we, then, if we begin taking those positive steps and not looking back, we can live that dream. So that those, those uh, insights from my, from my circle of friends really kind of still resonates with me. So here I stand, a black woman in a mostly white state, having moved here. I'm a West Virginian by choice. I've, I moved here um, 
over 22 years ago. So now I've lived here more than I've lived anywhere else. But I was born, I'm an immigrant. I am a, a legal immigrant. So if the guy with the hair becomes president, I'm not gonna be missing. I'm, a, you know, <laughs> I'm now a naturalized citizen. I was born in Guyana in South America. And I, I, you know, I moved to New York, Brooklyn, New York when I was a teenager. And I see my family work. They started over, the, my parents, starting over their career from ground zero. So I know what it is to have nothing, you know, coming from nothing and, and starting from the bottom. So I stand on, on the shoulders of great civil rights leaders, great leaders in our state here in West Virginia. Great civil, right lead, civil rights leaders like Dr. King who fought the good fight so that I can experience the liberties that I do now and I never take the freedom of this great nation for granted. When the Reverend Dr. King took to the podium at the Lincoln Memorial at the March on Washington to, del to deliver his famous speech, the text in his hand did not read, I have a dream. That was not the original name of the speech. The working title of the speech was Normalcy Never Again. The I have a dream refrain and the part of the address that it punctuated and propelled was improvised on the spot. More than 50 years later, the speech endures as a defining moment in the civil rights movement. Dr. King spoke in August of 1963 at the biggest, most important civil rights demonstration in our, in our history. It was the heart of the civil rights movement. It was eight years after the anti-segregation Montgomery bus boycott. It was three years after the lunch counter sit-ins in Nashville and Greensboro. It was two years after the first freedom rides on interstate buses through the South. And it was three months after police in Birmingham, Alabama horrified the nation by using attack dogs and fire hoses against women and children protesting segregated public facilities. Dr. King's speech continues to be heralded as a beacon in the ongoing struggle for racial equality. The speech was a call for economic equality. We often tend to focus on the dream, we hear about the dream a lot, the dream, the dream, the dream. But this was a radical economic message for jobs and freedom prompted by the Jim Crow laws. Dr. King's emphasis was on economic injustice with the key points raised around a bounce check that America had given black people. He contrasted the conditions of the day with the Emancipation Proclamation, which had occurred 100 years earlier. He said, just a, a brief bit about what he said, but 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still languishing in the corners of American society and finds himself an exile in his own land. So we have come here today to dramatize a shameful situation. In a sense, we have come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every America, every American was to fall ear. The note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white women, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note in so far as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, 
America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check that has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So we have come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualization, gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of, father, of, of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all God's children. In 2016, and in light of what has been occurring in our, in our country for the last few years, to Trayvon Martin and Jordan Davis and Michael Brown and Tamir Rice and Freddie Gray, just to name a few, I still cry out, now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. How much has really changed from Dr. King's prophetic eloquence captivating the world in 1963? Within two years of the march, Dr. King was, say, was saying that his optimistic dream of 1963 had turned into a nightmare. Dr. King attributed his own growing discouragement to urban riots, the Vietnam War, indifference to black poverty, and, uh, and opposition to desegregation in northern cities. How, for example, would contemporary observers respond to his statement that the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination? Many might look at the singular success of people like Jay-Z and Beyonce and Oprah and LeBron and decide that such an assessment is no longer applicable. But then a study of data denoting the disproportionate number of African Americans occupying prison cells, the disproportionate number of unemployed and underemployed African Americans, the rate of high school dropouts, the number of early deaths from homicide and other well-known existing conditions could cause your perceptions to shift. So where do we go from here? Written in 1967, where do we go from here? Chaos, chaos or Community is actually the title of Dr. King's final book. Where do we go from here was Dr. King's analysis of the state of American race relations and the movement after a decade of the US civil rights struggles. He wrote that with Selma and the Voting Rights Act, one phase of development in the civil rights revolution came to an end. Dr. King believed that the next phase of the movement would bring its own challenges as African Americans continued to make demands for better jobs, higher wages, decent housing, and, and an education equal to that of whites. And a guarantee that the rights won on the civil rights, in the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 would be enforced by the federal government. Dr. King made several suggestions in his book, several recommend, recommendations. In, in the book, Where Do We Go From Here? He wants pe black people to have, to gain self-respect, what he called a rugged sense of somebody, somebodiness. He also wanted black, black people to passionately work for group identity. This plea is directed especially to middle class and professional blacks, many of whom fail or refuse to identify 
and work with their less educated or less fortunate brethren. He also encouraged black people to take the initiative to implement the rights and opportunities that they already have, to walk through the doors that have already been opened. He also encouraged us to go on with his struggle for full equality through mass nonviolent action and the ballot. He also encouraged us to push his claims for freedom and equality beyond of decent housing and adequate income. And in this struggle, we must see ourselves as only a part of a larger mass of millions of poverty-stricken Americans. Dr. King's teachings are still relevant today. Many of us still lack self-respect. Many of us who have made it out of the hood are too self-absorbed and unconcerned about the poor and don't reach back to give others a helping hand, a hand up. So many citizens are still without jobs and in bondage to ills like drug abuse. In fact, West Virginia has the lowest labor force participation rate in the country. Drug overdoses now kill more West Virginians than car accidents. Drugs are the leading cause of accidental deaths in our state, and we have the nation's highest rate of drug deaths. As you know, substance abuse and unemployment are precursors to criminal activity and hence incarceration. Many of us still don't even bother to vote. And many of us still live in poverty-stricken poverty conditions. So as responsible citizens, I think it's important for us to write a vision for what we want our world to be like. As guided by the prophet Habakkuk, I needed, to, I needed personally to write a vision and make it plain upon tables so that anyone who reads it will run with it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it shall surely come, it will not tarry. My vision for this great state, for this great nation of ours is grand. I'm not gonna you know, go into all the details about it, but it includes a, 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 a country, a state, with no child living in poverty. My vision includes access to quality education, just like the governor said, for all children of our state, starting at birth, all the way through university. And a key element of my vision also is that all able-bodied adults will have access to jobs that pay living wages. These three elements form the essence of my vision for our state and for our nation. No child poverty, quality education, and employment for all. Would you run with that vision? Governor, I think our governor is running with that vision. The realist in me is mindful of the fact that in our world, even though some may have access to all the rights and privileges and benefits and assets, they may still not achieve their full potential and end up on drugs and or in prison. Consequently, there is a critical need for transitional services that give people support and second chances. We at, at KID, this has been a great part of our work at KISRA. We educate, we coach, we create jobs, we provide resources, and make opportunities available to those who need it the most so that the families around our state will be strengthened. In my new role at the Greater Kanawha Valley Foundation, I'll be, I wouldn't be doing it directly, but I will, it will be supporting organizations that are doing this work in a six county region. Before young people especially, before you get to the point of, of creating a vision, it's important to have some goals. Starting with some personal goals. Goals provide direction, a sense of accomplishment, and they define your growth and development. How do you get from a dream to a goal? Just add some action steps and a target date. You see a dream plus action steps plus a target date give, gives you a goal. We all gotta have some goals, amen? So in closing, I always like to, to whenever I want, to encourage, I want to feel encouraged, 
I look to the great poet Langston Hughes who penned a poem that always gives me hope when I face the harsh realities of life. He writes, hold fast to dreams for if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams for when dreams go, life is a barren field frozen with snow. May God bless each and every one of you as we work for diversity in West Virginia. Thank you, Dr. Foster. Dr. Foster has issued a challenge to us and, and she made a very profound statement when she said that now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. And we can do that by being active and proactive in our communities. And Dr. Foster, we accept your challenge that, and we do believe that no child in West Virginia or in the world should live in poverty. That we should have quality education for all and that everyone should have the opportunity to have a job so that they can support their family. Thank you so much for issuing those challenges to us and take those back to your communities and make those realities. Before we hear the delightful music again, uh, from Ms. J Ms. Jackson and Bob Thompson, I would like to take this time to give some personal acknowledgments. We do want to thank the governor's office and staff for their support of our Martin Luther King Jr. holiday activities. And just a reminder that If you go to the governor's Flickr account, and I'm not, I don't go on Flickr, but Dr. Stewart said that that's available, that you can see the awards that, that, that will be posted. So please visit that account. We want to also thank our good friends in the Division of Culture and History through the years. Randall Reed Smith and Karen Gresham have always provided us support and they have staff assisting with photography and the mounting of the posters. Upon behalf of the commission, we thank you for assisting with that. And many times, just because you're an executive director, you don't get the acknowledgement that you should get, but we want to personally thank Dr. Carolyn Stewart and Maisha Robinson for the work they do. We couldn't survive without you. And my fellow commissioners, we, there are a few of us, but we work hard and I just love them so much. Would our commissioners please stand so that you can see these people that work, Anthony, all, Michelle, Kay Goodwin. We are so proud of the expertise that they bring to the table to assist in the work of the commission. And then finally, I want to thank my sisters of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority for their help. They always help with getting the posters judged and we had a time getting these posters to the uh, Culture Center this year because they were so large, but thanks to West Virginia State for giving me a van that I drove up here with these posters. And thank you, Alpha Kappa Alpha, for serving as our hostesses. After the musical selection, we will have the benediction by the Reverend Jerry Staples, but I just want to remind you that we do have a reception. And the reception is like a down-home reception with fried chicken, mashed potatoes, greens, cornbread. We hope that you will stay and enjoy the reception. So just don't leave as soon as everything is over. And please take time to also relish in the work that has been done by our students. Look at their artwork, you know, take a picture beside it, and take that back to your communities so that you will inspire other children to enter in our competition. 
And now, at this time, without further ado, Ms. Mary Jackson and Mr. Bob Thompson with their musical selection. Thank you. I'm just going to play uh, two quick pieces for you, and I just want to tell you a little bit about them ahead of time. The first one was written by um, a great jazz pianist, the late great Dr. Billy Taylor, who was uh, not only a great pianist and musician, but he was a, an educator and he did lots of work with young people. And he was a person who inspired me during my years uh, starting out in music. Anyway, that piece was also a piece that he said when he saw Dr. King, Dr. King always asked him to play this piece. And it's called, I Wish I Knew How It Would Feel to Be Free. I'll open with that, and then I want to leave you with uh, something on a little lighter note, something that uh, with a, a little touch of optimism, and this is a piece that was made famous by uh, the late, great Louis Armstrong. It's called uh, What a Wonderful World, and I think that when, when people come together like this and are working towards it, that uh, we may be able to say one day, it is a wonderful world. So these two pieces for you. Hope you enjoy
Thank you again, Mr. Thompson, for those wonderful selections. Let's give him another round of applause, please. After our benediction, would you please join us for our reception and please take time to greet the members of the commission and one another. We hope that you have safe travels home. Be careful as you return to your communities and don't forget the charge that our speaker gave us about doing our part to make this world a better place. Reverend Staples. May we bow our heads. Father, we thank you for such a uh, great display of uh, talent, such a great display of youth. Lord, we pray that you would bless these youth, make their minds as sponges, that uh, they would be able, O oh God, to continue to learn and to spread the joy uh, of the good news of diversity throughout this land and this country, and especially the state of West Virginia. Thank you, O oh God, for our great governor, for this commission, and Lord God, we just thank you for all your many blessings for uh, this day, for this is a day which the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Finally, God, we thank you, O oh God, in advance for a safe passage for all of us back home, and God, we uh, just give you praise and glory for the chicken that has been prepared, for chicken died that man might live. Amen. <laughs>